Triton is an AI-enabled platform for surgical bleeding. Very excited to uh, share it with you guys. I think that was an excellent clinical intro, um, really about the gestalt in negotiating blood loss as opposed to estimating blood loss. Uh, disclosures, I, I founded the company, so I'm very conflicted. Um, just thought I should state that to be very clear. You can't be more conflicted than That's right. If you're not conflicted, you're not interested. Um, uh, we are digitally transforming the operating room with uh, an AI-enabled platform, and there's there's many, many different things we can do with AI in surgery, uh, but we've really focused on bleeding uh, as the core. Um, we are supported by Providence Ventures, so the venture capital arm of Swedish and the rest of the Providence uh, healthcare system, as well as a few other investors, um, both in healthcare and in tech. Um, so the story starts out when I was in grad school. I was following some of my PIs around um, the operating rooms, and I asked a lot of naive questions. And one of those questions was, well, how do you know how much blood was lost, and, and how do you know how much blood to transfuse um, if you're just guesstimating the blood loss? So I saw arguments or negotiations happening on both sides uh, and both questions. I, I just can't help myself. Yeah. I'm so glad you're showing Dr. Hart losing a lot of blood. Yes. <laughs> That's actually the next slide, uh, which is what I, <laughs> no, this is a, I think this is a cardiac procedure. Um, <laughs> Um, and so what we noticed, right, is just a bunch of engineers watching surgery was, wow, that like that's a lot of blood. And we started to ask these questions. Well, how do you decide when to transfuse, whether or not to transfuse, and if so, how much? Um, and as we dug deeper, we found that you know, anesthesiologists are relying on gestalt, and they're looking at a lot of different you know, vital signs. Um, Intraoperative hemoglobin tends to be significantly confounded by, you know, the the um, the dilution due to other fluids and fluid shifts, and so we saw that just checking a hemoglobin serially during a surgery is not only delayed; it's it's not really going to give you an answer as to what the volemic status of the patient is. And as we dug deeper, we found that well, it turns out hospitals care about transfusions; they're very expensive. Um, the immunosuppression isn't, you know, very uh, good for patients if transfusions are unnecessary. So so could there be a way to better optimize transfusion decision making in these long, oozy, or very bloody procedures um, using a tool that could give you the right piece of information? And then we were sort of taken a little sideways, I would say, looking at maternal health care, because it turns out that monitoring bleeding in childbirth is actually becoming sort of a national standard. Um, we've adopted so-called QBL, or quantified blood loss in obstetrics, where you literally have nurses and anesthesiologists sort of collaborating to weigh the sponges, subtract the dry weights, try and guesstimate how much of these other non-sanguineous fluids were on the sponges, and so it really becomes more of a guessing game, but we're still trying to solve the problem, so much so that there are a number of statewide and you know, national bodies that have gone and adopted quantification of blood loss as a standard within obstetrics. Uh, Illinois has passed a regulatory mandate that every childbirth in Illinois has to have a QBL, not an EBL, or estimated blood loss. Um, so that's where we sort of came in with our technology. Uh, we call it Triton. And what Triton does is it uses the iPad, and it's powered by machine learning and computer vision algorithms uh, in surgery to scan the sponges and the canisters to tell you what the blood loss is. And specifically, it eradicates this practice of weighing, which is confounded by the invisible fluids, the amniotic fluid, the ascites, the saline. And we can essentially do this entirely photometrically. So we literally took an iPad, and we turned it into a class two medical device. And yeah, it took seven FDA clearances over seven years um, to, to really bring this to market. But ultimately, it really just is a cloud-based app that you can download off the App Store. Um, the way the technology works is we're scanning these sponges, right, as, as they're being, they have to be counted so that we don't leave a sponge behind intraoperatively. And during that sponge counting process, we figured out how to sort of scan the sponge very quickly into the screen of the iPad using the front-facing camera, sort of taking a selfie. And from that instant image, we can actually quantify, based on every single pixel that we're looking at, what the hemoglobin mass is per pixel. And then we can sort of uh, relate that to the 
total blood volume held on that sponge at whatever preoperative hemoglobin that blood was at. Um, so here's a brief video of the technology and how it how it performs. Um, essentially, you have the, the sponges that come and sit around in the kick buckets, and then you have the suction canisters, which um, you know you mentioned look like Kool Aid. And so we're basically just scanning the sponges in during the counting process. So it takes a second, uh, it fits right into sort of the surgical workflow, and it also acts as an aid in the practice of managing sponges. Uh, the scan the canister gets scanned. We're dialing the pre-op. Uh, hemoglobin and the total volume in the canister. And then anything like clots or chucks can be weighed using an integrated scale so that we have sort of a total blood loss. So you can weigh things that are not confounded by these other fluids. So what's the value of doing any of this? Um, you know, blood loss has been estimated, like I've always said, since the dawn of medicine. So what's the point of suddenly measuring it? Uh, well, we think that it can actually be a predictive indicator of what's happening in the surgery and where, you know, Blood loss might be oozy, it may sort of slowly creep up on the team, and this tool can track it sort of in more of a real-time fashion so that we can then start to diagnose those, those cases that are bleeding at a, a much higher rate that we might have not previously recognized. Um, so this is really where we're trying to unlock the value with the system is really its data. So in terms of progress, we've made a little progress probably since um, since the, the introduction. Um, we've now scaled to about 50 hospitals in the US, we're doing about 200 thousand procedures a year, largely labor and delivery. We do have uh, some folks using this in pediatric spine and burns as, as well. So those are all, I think, great use cases of surgeries where bleeding can be high, transfusion rates are high, and the need to have an ongoing tally of blood loss is, is critical. Um, the thing I'll say, and I always say this when we talk about this technology, is you know, we seem to see this sort of curve. This is our utilization curve, number of procedures per week, and this is is uh, a little outdated now. What's uh, very exciting or not so exciting about this is the x-axis is how long it actually took uh, to, to get this nascent technology out there. It's literally taken several years. Um, we had you know a year in which we had one surgeon in the country using the technology a few times a week, and now it's sort of been able to scale up to the point where you're seeing sustained growing utilization. Um, so I always like to point out the x-axis here. Um, it takes a very long time um, to, to create a medical technology and to really translate it. So now that we're on the path to bringing this into you know, clinical practice, how are we delivering value? Um, we've broken this down clinically into sort of three buckets. We've looked at recognition of hemorrhage. So in C-sections, we define hemorrhage as, you know, a thousand cc's or greater. Um, and that's the, the updated definition for both C-sections and vaginal deliveries. Um, we've looked at transfusion rates. You know, can we actually alter transfusion rates? They tend to be very low at baseline in the C-section population, so it's, it's not quite the same as maybe a burn surgery. Um, and then we've looked at some downstream endpoints, um, which, you know, may be significant, but, but may not actually be, you know, fully causal. Um, we've done four studies to date. Uh, the first and the fourth have been published, and the other two are still undergoing review. Um, this is sort of an early look at our performance improvement data. Um, what we've seen is a few interesting patterns, and I'll just share them at a high level. The first thing we've seen is that the detection rates of hemorrhage go up uh, significantly. And that sort of makes sense, because if we've been saying that every C-section is 800 cc's, you know, since we began practicing, then it, it tends to make sense that, okay, if you now actually start measuring it, you'll see something very different. So this has been very interesting for our existing installed base of devices. Now, secondary to that, we're actually finding that transfusion rate rates are dropping. Um, and not only are rates dropping, both the rates and or the dose of blood, if, if you are doing a transfusion, the dose seems to be much lower when Triton was present and being used as part of their decision-making process. So we think that this is a factor of real-time data helping enable real-time decision-making and more rational decision-making, where instead of giving you know, two units, we might actually give one, which leads to these lower averages um, overall.
And then we've seen some long, you know, long-term sort of downstream impacts. Um, we've seen associations and significant associations with length of stay being decreased. We think this is, again, somewhat related to many factors, one of them being reduced transfusion, one of them being just earlier decision-making and catching the bleeding, but it's hard to tell in a study uh, like this what exactly caused the reduced length of stay. So this is just data. We've thresholded the patients at four days uh, postpartum in, in these cases and seen that you know, their, their um, length of stay overall was significantly less by, by whole days. So what we think is happening is that this device may be reducing bleeding, it may be reducing hemodilution, which would then lead to you know, lower hemoglobins if we just waited, 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 uh, and then lead to a transfusion. Um, and we think that this is also improving you know, compliance with protocols. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a hospital in the East Coast, um, one of these study sites, that has used this technology now to set a rule that postpartum day one, um, the patient should not get out of bed if they lost a QBL greater than 1,000 cc's. And what they found was that their fall rate dropped significantly just based on that simple change. Um, previously, it was sort of left up to their best judgment. If you feel OK, feel free to get out of bed and, and use the restroom. And so we think that those are the different kinds of impacts that these new types of tools uh, can give. It's kind of like installing an energy meter at home and then seeing overall your energy bills are starting to, to reduce. And, and it's hard to pinpoint why exactly, but it's definitely a performance improvement that we can then further tease out. And this is really why we think this is having success in OB to that point is they have a very complex protocol um, for dealing with a hemorrhage. This is a standardized national level protocol. It's been adopted in multiple countries. Um, and what these protocols do is basically use blood loss as the trigger for different stages of intervention in conjunction with other clinical signs. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are using these in orthopedics, but certainly in OB, this is you know what's been standardized. And so following this then accurately would require that central tenet, which is ongoing blood loss evaluation, to really be accurate. And that's where we're trying to drive a performance improvement by just enabling this protocol. So we started to look at uh, spine surgeries, and we just looked at a few papers and pulled up some data. First off, we found that there seemed to be some similarities between C-sections and spine surgeries, and that both of those types of surgeries end up um, in, in these sort of quote unquote hemorrhage situations, which can then be pulled up in the medical legal data. So we found that, okay, that was an interesting similarity. Um, the second trend we saw was that, you know, of all the different orthopedic cases that we've looked at, um, spine surgeries tend to be relatively more, more bloody. And, and, and this is, again, based on certain data sets. That we've also looked at minimally invasive surgery now coming into spines. Um, the third trend that we're finding is that you know, if you're doing a multi-level case, the more levels, the more blood. That probably makes intuitive sense, but you know, a few folks have measured these in, in different studies. Um, and then lastly, we found that you know, MIS is being associated with lower blood losses um, and significantly decreased rates of transfusion. So I'm preaching to the choir here. I think what's interesting here is that uh, two things I'll point out. The first one is that many uh, surgical studies for new interventions or devices, they tend to use EBL as an endpoint in their surgeries. Um, and, and that's an endpoint we think we can start to make a lot more um, quantitative by using this technology. We can actually redefine whether or not a new technique is actually as low bleeding as we think it was. Um, the second thing we, we, we found is that there are many um, you know, instances in MIS and in our conversations with Dr. Rowe that, that perhaps this tool could still be useful in a minimally invasive setting because you still have multiple incisions and because the bleeding is just oozy and, and, and longer term and may even extend postoperatively. Um, so to that point, we've started to dig deeper into spine, and, and we found that in Pete's cases, you know, this is a low volume type of surgery, so it's not a huge market for a technology like this, um, but it definitely has a higher clinical need, and we've seen that with uh, uptake of our system, uh, regardless of whether TXA was, was being used. Um, and then just at a high level, we also have to consider the differences in care in a spine case that, that you wouldn't really see in a C-section. Um, so TXA, uh, cell salvage, and uh, I guess we're not using tourniquets and spines, but just in general in orthopedics, uh, you have these different types of interventions that you're not seeing in other, other types of surgeries. So that's an interesting element to consider when implementing a technology like this.
So where are we going with this more broadly? I'll just give you guys a very high level view. We think that beyond bleeding, we can actually use AI on this platform in very different ways. One of them is actually sponge counting. And so we've built a pattern recognition algorithm that uses deep learning, actually uses the blood patterns on every sponge to make sure that you counted the sponges correctly. So it's kind of a different spin on this idea of sponge counting using barcodes or RFID tags, but this is using software alone. Uh, we also think we can then start to digitize these hemorrhage protocols. So if we take the obstetrical protocol, turn it into an application, uh, we think we can actually start driving it sort of like a GPS using the very same mobile device in a surgery. That makes it easier for the nurses. It makes it more uh, easy to comply with the system. And finally, we think that there might be views of the same data that can actually be predictive. So what if you could, as a surgeon, have a real-time dashboard of this specific multi-level spine case with your blood loss as a trend, and then compared to maybe the national average of blood losses or your own previous historical average. So we think there are interesting ways of displaying the same data around bleeding, since it, it tends to be a vector for sort of how the surgery is going and whether there's risk involved. Uh, and we know surgeons are very competitive, so we think this type of data may actually help make the conversation about blood loss more interesting uh, and actionable during a case. That's all I have. Thank you. Wow.